my name is Josephine Lang, and I've been a medical intuitive for 30 years, and I really love my work. It is my joy. And I had um, a num number of wonderful mentors who really helped me on my path. Probably the first and foremost was my horse. When I was 11, I saved up my babysitting money and bought myself a horse. And for $100, a Mustang. And we had a wonderful time riding all over the hills together. And she really taught me about psychic ability and about intuition and about listening. Horses have a very well-developed enteric nervous system, which is the, a nervous system in their gut that allows them to feel what's going on. So if all the horses are sleeping and one horse is awake and they see a bicyclist, they'll pick up their heads and look and every other horse will immediately wake up and notice what's going on. So horses are very connected that way. And I rode bareback because when I could buy the horse, I couldn't buy a saddle and a bridle, so I just went bareback. And because of that, I was able to really, you know, feel what my horse was feeling. And I think that we all have a very profound feeling sense. In fact, I think we all have psychic ability. We all have gut feelings. We all have experiences of psychic ability that we may not um, have really profound ones like premonitions and things, but people do have those experiences. And we, a lot of times, will have uh, deja vus or knowing when somebody's calling on the telephone, like Rupert has studied, uh, the sense of being stared at, some of those more common psychic abilities. And if we haven't had any direct psychic abilities ourselves, we usually know somebody that we love and trust who has had a psychic ability that was quite extensive. And that sort of lets us see that it does exist and it is real. And of course, with this group here, you guys all know about these extended human capacities. And that's a really wonderful thing. So I don't need to really convince you about them. But most people that I do speak with, I do kind of have to talk to them about it a little bit because they so often feel that it doesn't really exist. And our psychic ability is very um, disapproved of in our culture. It's not looked upon favorably. You're kind of considered a wacko if you have psychic ability. And so I, for many years, when I first began to exhibit my empathy and began to have my psychic ability come on quite strongly for me, I hid it. I didn't tell people about what I did. People would say, well, what do you do? And I would say, honestly, well, I just finished painting the house or something like that, rather than saying, well, I work as a medical intuitive, because there were so many times where I would get the rolled eyes and the cold shoulder, that sort of thing, and it was, um, I just thought, well, people are so quick to judge, I won't bother. But what really happens is our psychic ability is a way for us to extend our knowledge to really increase our knowing of what we know. It's a way for us to perceive things. And knowledge is great. And knowing things is wonderful. And it can really help us to develop. And for me, the main reason why I have come out to speak about psychic ability and to teach about psychic ability is because our psychic ability really shows us that we are all connected. We are all interconnected. And when we understand that we are all interconnected, we can no longer pollute or cut down a rainforest than we would cut off our foot. I mean, why would we do something like that? So that is my ulterior motive for <laughs> teaching and embracing psychic ability in my life. And. Um, and it's one that I think serves us well. And for myself, I came from a family of psychics. I had psychic ability on both sides. I had a grandmother who was an animal communicator. I had a grandfather who was a dowser. And uh, dowsing is one of those few psychic abilities that is widely accepted in the, in the Midwest. Once when I went to visit Nebraska, where my family was from, my cousin picked me up at the airport and she said, well, Josephine, what are you doing with yourself these days? And I said, well, I work as a medical intuitive. I help people with their well-being, with uh, receiving psychic impressions for them. And then uh, they can go ahead and use that information to bring about balance and, and seek the balance of health. And she said, oh, well, I wouldn't tell anybody that here. <laughs> 
And so I thought, okay, well, I won't then. But yet my grandfather was a dowser because dowsing, when you live in a farming community, somebody who can find water is a very valuable person, right? So he would walk around with his forked stick and he would let the stick tell him where water was and that was a perfectly acceptable form of psychic ability. So our psychic ability does help us to really increase our knowledge of our world and of everything around us. So it's a beautiful thing. So not only did I have a grandmother and a grandfather who exhibited psychic ability, but I had a mother who was a very strong premonition dreamer. And she would receive information that was life-saving. I grew up on a little lake, and in the 60s, 1960s, um, there was an alligator had been released in the lake, and nobody knew about it. It was an alligator that you used to be able to get alligators in pet stores. And this alligator was, had outgrown its former inhabitant, or its former home, and so somebody released it in the lake. And it was about four feet long, and it was long enough to grab a small child and pull it underwater and hide it under a boat or something that was sunken down in the bottom, and then eat it over time, which is what they tend to do. And my mother woke up in the middle of the night knowing that this was the case, and she told us we couldn't swim in the lake anymore. So we were all uproariously up affected by that because it was hot summertime and it was we wanted to swim and she said no 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 you're not and I'm not telling you why and then of course a few days later the alligator was found so there's some more knowledge right good knowledge life-saving knowledge and my older brother inherited premonition as well and my father was a reincarnational child he exhibited xenoglossy the ability to speak in another language that's not your own he spoke a little Hindi as a young boy and so when, uh, you know, I was growing up, I thought, well, what about me? You know, I don't seem to have any psychic abilities. And I felt a little left out, but oh well, you know, these things happen. And then as I got into my late 20s, all of a sudden I had a very peculiar and very weird thing start to happen to me. And that was that I began to feel the physical symptoms in my body that other people nearby me were feeling. And what do you do with that? That was so uncomfortable and weird. So if I was in line at the grocery store and I was standing next to somebody, all of a sudden I'd start feeling really bad back pain or something. I'd think, oh gosh, what is that? Ah. And so I'd go and change lanes and the back pain would go away. But next thing I knew, I was starting to feel a really splitting headache. And I thought, oh, this is not fun or any good at all. So um, I went to a chiropractor friend of mine who was a phenomenal chiropractor. He did muscle testing. And he had a body language that he could use with the body where he could, you know, touch the liver or, you know, make a signal to the, we're dissolving or, or wake up or whatever it was, using the meridians of the body, basically, to go ahead and use muscle testing to find out if a particular area was injured or, or in pain or was not working properly. And then he would go ahead and treat people, and he did a wonderful job of this. But every once in a while, you know how it is in a business or in a work like that, where you can't quite diagnose everybody or find out what's going with everyone. And so I come into him and I say, hey, I've got this very weird thing going on. I'm feeling other people's stuff. And he had read some of Edgar Cayce's work. I wasn't really very familiar with it. But he said, you know, if you know what's going on with somebody else, what's going on with this person? And he would hand me a patient card of somebody who he was having a hard time diagnosing. And sure enough, I'd just take a look at the name and address and hold the card on my belly and I'd start to feel what it was that was going on with them. Like, oh, well, this feels like their kidneys are tight or I feel kidney pain. And of course, over the years we worked together and I got more and more uh, able to really fine tune my impressions of what I was receiving and know exactly what was the cause behind the problems. And we would work together for maybe two or three hours, two or three times a week. And he would save up his patient cards for the people that he was having a hard time with. And he would just hand them to me. And I'd be able to tell him in two or three seconds or two or three minutes what was going on and how they could bring about change. And he never really told people that he was going to be consulting a psychic about this. He just said, you know, if he couldn't get through a person's diagnostics in 15 minutes or so, he'd say, okay, let me consult with a colleague and, and um, I'll get back to you, come back on Friday and we'll work together. And so then he would get the information that we were, came up with together and then he would take it to that patient and ta-da, he'd have successes. 
So it was a very wonderful time in my life, and I felt very, very thrilled to be doing this work. And anything that really makes us really happy and joyous like that is the right thing to do. And of course, until I started working using my psychic ability, my empathy, it, it did, you know, I was like a human sponge. But as soon as I started using it to help others, ta-da, I was no longer the human sponge. I didn't feel things. Now I have an ability to just really completely turn it off because I am serving. I'm doing what nature intended for me to do. I got a degree in horticulture. I thought I was going to be a gardener for the rest of my life. I loved it. It was wonderful. But, you know, nature sometimes has other ideas. And so in came this strong psychic ability that I wasn't expecting and didn't know how to grapple with until I began to work with it in this wonderful situation that I had. And with this good doctor's diagnostics, I could tell immediately, um, you know, if I was working with a patient card and I could feel something, that would be accurate. If I came at it with a memory of something that, well, you know, this person who had a similar symptom had a kidney problem a week ago or so, then that didn't work so well. That the, My own memory or what I was thinking about or thinking that it might be was always the less accurate. My psychic intuitive flashes or just my hunches would always be the accurate ones. And so because I had the ability to fine tune over the years as we worked together, which were my intuitive insights or my intuitive flashes, then I was able to really refine my uh, skills. And as with anything, whatever we practice, we get better at, right? Such a, a simple thing. You know, somebody sits down at the piano, you know, they can probably play chopsticks today. But if they're going to do Chopin, they're going to need a few years. And so the same holds true with our psychic ability. And so uh, before we get into any exercises, I always like to start my work with a spiritual agreement. And so I'd like to ask you all to make this agreement with me today. It goes like this. Together we acknowledge that everything that we think, that we say, and that we do at this time will be of the highest good. And together we ask for truth, the understanding of that truth, and the wisdom to use it in our lives. Can you all agree? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a lovely agreement. So our service needs to be joyous. And when we are in joyous service, everything goes beautifully in our lives. Things really, even if we have challenges, they turn out to be blessings. If we have tears, they wind up being our joy. So in my work, it didn't take too long until um, word got out that I was, I was not just working in private with this doctor friend of mine, and I began to receive calls. I never advertised, I never came forward and said, this is what I do, but people just started calling. And then this little interconnected net began to form of the word of mouth around the globe. And now I've actually had calls from every continent on the globe, including Antarctica, which was <laughs> really fun. I was out watering in the backyard, and Frank came out and said, I, I think you want to take this call. They're coming, calling from McMurdo Station. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll come in. <laughs> and so that's a really wonderful thing and, and uh, makes me very happy to know. And I've heard it said, and I think it's really true, that all scripture was channeled at some point. And I think that all channelers everywhere practiced. Either they were writing letters to their friends or they were working with parchment in a cave somewhere. But we work on these things. We, we practice it so that we get better. And what we do when we're practicing is we are learning how to surrender ourselves more and more to our higher self, to that individual part of ourself that is our God self. You know, I think of the snow sparkling in the sunlight, like we'll see today. And each of those, there's, a, there's an individual snowflake in the snow, right? All, it's made up of hundreds and thousands of individual snowflakes, all a part of the divinity. We all have a part of the divine within us. And um, so I'd like for you to just take a moment to affirm with me. And you can just affirm from your own divinity, or you can use the words God, if you like, oh God. Allow me to be aware of the presence of goodness in life. Let me know of those in spirit who assist me each day, and let me love them as they love me. 
Because we do have assisters or people or beings that assist us in spirit. We are this, we are all part of the same divine. We're all part of the same gigantic spirit family. We are magnificent and enormous. And I think that when we are born, we suddenly find ourselves sort of stuffed down into this tiny little body. And to allow ourselves to begin to remember the spirit that is around us all the time is a beautiful way for us to open up to our psychic ability because our spirit friends and helpers are constantly nudging and urging us. I have a British grandmother who uh, wrote me a letter before she passed away to say, darling, I'll be helping you from whatever planet I'm on. And I've had so many synchronistic experiences that have come from Britain. My editor, my agent for my book, different things have happened where, um, and I always know, and I just sort of feel, and sometimes they can be subtle like that. Whenever I catch into that idea of England, the country of England, I, I, I know that there's something at play there for me. But sometimes things are not so subtle, our psychic abilities. I've also had uh, helpers from spirit, and I'm sure many of you have had something like this too, where um, one night my Uncle Vernon appeared to me beside my bed. He had just passed away a few days before, and we were going to be going down to his uh, funeral service, and we were getting a very late night before an early start, so we were only going to have about two hours of sleep. There they go, the curtains. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Vernon, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, he just, I was, I was just barely, barely asleep. I was in that hypnagogic state and I was laying there and suddenly I realized as my eyes are just barely open, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm looking at my Uncle Vernon and he's smiling at me. And I kind of came up onto my elbow and looked at him, and, and he just sort of doffed his little golfing cap at me, and he said, you kids stay home. I know that you loved me. And so I rolled over, and I tapped on Frank. I said, hey, turn off the alarm, because Vernon has uh, just told me to stay home. And I realized years later that if you drive when you're very, very sleep-deprived, like we would have been with only two hours of sleep, it's about the same as driving really drunk. And I think he saved our lives. So sometimes spirit nudges us in not-so-subtle ways as well beyond just synchronicities. And I think that when we call upon spirit, which I like to do, so one of the affirmations that I say whenever I begin my work is that I honor my shields of light and of protection and that of the earth, and I acknowledge that my shields protect me against the ignorance of others. That is, in a way, calling upon that beautiful realm of spirit to assist me and to help me. And we can also call in spirit in other ways, like I'll often say if there's a problem or I see something going on in a situation where there's maybe some discord, I'll just say, with my sense of command, coming from that part that is the unified divinity, like the snow, angels here now. And it's, a, it's a, not a, you know, angry command, it's a compassionate command. Angels here now. And then I immediately feel a shift in my own energy. It's like the kind of shift that we feel when we pray, when we pray for someone with love in our hearts, when we open our hearts to people. Suddenly the energy changes all around us. And when that occurs, when I feel that, when I make that kind of a request of the universe, then I feel this change that occurs right there and around us. And immediately everything will begin to shift. Who was it? Somebody was saying uh, within the last couple of days that they had received some guidance from one of their teachers who said, how is nature working for you? And I thought that was so brilliant. How is nature working for you? How, how are you in harmony? Are you in harmonious flow with the world? And when we find that there is a time where we're not in harmonious flow, then we can call it to us through using our, our ability to stand in our own divinity and call it forward. So when I'm doing my work, I will, when I first, I have a whole protocol that I go through and a little interview process before I begin. And then when I actually settle down to do my work, I do some extensive meditations and prayers and things. Good heavens, <laughs> things are happening. <laughs> and then I'll put my hand on the person's name and address and then I just sit in receptive silence and I wait and see what comes through for me. 
And sometimes I'll receive images or impressions or I'll hear things or I'll have tastes or other sensations in my body. And this is exactly what Toddy was talking about, our extended human capacities. We want to open up our senses to allow each of us to begin to feel our senses more deeply. And so what I'd like to do right now is to just go ahead and move into a little exercise with all of you, if you wouldn't mind. And so why don't you take a moment to just settle down into your chairs. And I like to get my feet flat on the floor, but whatever is comfortable. I really am a firm believer in comfort. So whatever feels just right to you is what you should do. And then this is sort of like flexing our muscles of our extended senses. And so go ahead and take a moment to think about the sense of taste. And think fondly of your sense of taste. It's a beautiful sense. And remember a taste that you love. And now think of a taste that you would love to experience sometime soon. Make a little mental note of that. And moving to our sense of hearing. Think of your auditory sense fondly. It's so nice that we can hear. Take a moment right now to just see what sounds you can hear in the room. And did you happen to notice that while you were listening, that mind chatter just sort of fell away? That's a nice thing. And now is there some sort of sound that you would like to hear? Perhaps it's a piece of music or the sound of a loved one's voice? Just take the first thing that comes to you and make a mental note of it. Now think of your, sound, your sense of smell. This is a very precious scent, scent, a very precious sense, the sense of scent. Is there a smell that you would love to smell? Maybe a rose or the sea air. Make a mental note of that. And think fondly of your ability to feel touch. You might notice how the chair you're sitting is in, in is supporting your body, or the drape of your clothing. And use your imagination to let yourself think of something that your body would love to feel might be the wagging of a dog's tail against your leg or someone touching your shoulder. Use your imagination. And make a mental note of this. And now think fondly of your ability to see. Let yourself imagine seeing something that you would love to see. It might be a glacier or the eyes of a new family member, a baby or someone marrying into the family. And just trust the first thing that comes to you. And then go ahead and allow yourself to just begin to come back to your normal waking consciousness. You might want to take a couple of relaxed and easy breaths. And open your eyes and move your body a little bit. Very nice. It's a lovely, simple exercise. Gets us sort of started a little bit. And now I'd like to move into one other little exercise. And this one is 
quite short, but it's a very sweet little exercise. So go ahead and close your eyes again. And think of your front door. Let yourself imagine your front door in your mind's eye. And now ask yourself, ask your front door what it would like to say to you if your front door could talk. Trust the first thing that comes. And make a mental note about this. And then go ahead and open your eyes and move your body a little bit. Let yourself return to your normal waking consciousness. Was everyone able to imagine their front door? Good. And was everyone ever able to receive a little message from their front door? And if you didn't receive a message, just go ahead and find me. I'll be around on the ship at some point. I have a lot of little tricks that can help us to move beyond. Sometimes there's those little hurdles at the beginning of really allowing ourselves freedom to sense and to perceive and to use our imagination. Like I said, we're not going to be playing Chopin by the end of the day, but we're just going to get started with a little chopsticks here. <laughs> So our psychic ability is useful. It helps us to gain knowledge about ourself and the world. And the powers of our mind are very underappreciated. And they're, for the most part, very underdeveloped because of our cultural bias against psychic ability. And why do we have a cultural bias? Well, I think there are many reasons. But there certainly is that there have been charlatans in the past, but of course we know we have charlatans everywhere. We have, certainly have charlatans in the banking in industry, <laughs> so <laughs> these things happen. Um, and then we, uh, we also have a fear sometimes of losing control. We think, well, if I really give myself over to my psychic ability, what, what happens if I suddenly find myself shaking or shivering or some other thing? Well, I find that usually if something really peculiar does happen, it doesn't last very long, like with me, with my empathy. It was when I finally started using it and working with it that it then finally, it just fell right into place and everything, was, everything irons itself out in the long run. And then I think the other reason for, and I think this might be the main reason actually, is that people who are following their own inner guidance are a little bit difficult to control. Right? It's nice to sort of tell people now, this is what you should do. And people who are afraid, of course, they want to have control. People who have some sort of a fear base, they want to be able to control people because then they know that things will go right if they just, if other people will just follow what I have to say. But when you're listening within for your answers, you're not so easy to control. So that's just my feeling on what that is about. And I think that as we expand our and improve our powers of perception, the basic area where we need to grow, it's not external, it's internal. We need to evaluate our own consciousness. We need to take a look at who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. And there are so many, one Milt's wonderful talk that just happened just before us, he was speaking about this. And then yesterday, Peter talking about that fine line of consciousness. Where does consciousness stop? Where does it start? Is it consciousness in humans? Is it consciousness in humans, animals, and plants? I certainly think it is. I actually live in a living universe. I think that our consciousness ex is a part of the fundamental consciousness that pervades everything. I think that our consciousness is a part of the same consciousness that's present in the stars and in the universe of stars above. I feel that our, our consciousness well, <laughs> can actually be in inanimate things as well. I feel that divine glance is winking out from everything all the time. And some people would beg to differ, but um, yeah, I've had experiences with my computer that have really blown my mind, where uh, I tend to shock computers, and computers tend to shock me. If I am handling the mouse, sometimes I'll get zapped, or if I get near a friend's computer, it starts going really haywire and things, because I guess I just exude some energy of some sort that can have an effect on these things. And my computer has actually completed and done tasks for me that I wanted to have done, but that I hadn't yet asked it to do. I'll come in, and it has already uploaded the slides for the show. Or I'll go to the computer with my 
printed copy of the writing that I'm doing with the editing in it, and the editing has already been entered into the computer. So something is going on there. I don't know what it is, but something is happening. And so I, I do feel that there's a lot more that meets, than meets the eye in our lives, and that the more that we can open up to it, the, the better things will be for all of us, for every one of us, because after all, we are all cells in the body of the world. We know that. We know that we are all part of the whole. It's all interconnected. And one of the things that shows us how interconnected this is, and this is one of my favorite examples of psychic ability, is that mind beyond the brain, that ability for us to know things that are way far away, like Rupert talks about, the mind beyond the brain. Somebody will wake up in the middle of the night and uh, knowing that a deceased loved one or a loved one has just died or that they are in trauma or that they are in grave need. Now, how could we possibly know that if we didn't have that connection? Some sort of distant reaching of our mind. Or Cleve Baxter's wonderful work in the 70s that he did with the polygraph test, the lie detector. And he hooked it up to everything, yogurt and the cat's food and, you know, <laughs> to see what was going on with the the reactions with bacteria and with um, the living organisms uh, distances away. So for instance, he'd get out the, the chicken for the cat and feed, go, be ready to feed it to the cat, and the yogurt, which had a, apparently a similar bacteria in another room, would go a little crazy on the lie detector. But the test that I really, the information that he, uh, one of the experiments that he did that I really loved was he would collect a living, Red, uh, white blood cells from the saliva in people's mouths. And then he would take that saliva on a dis you know, he would, the person would then travel a distance away and he would still have the saliva in his laboratory. And the person would be um, intentionally watching something that would evoke an emotional response. And then their saliva 300 miles away in, in uh, Cleve Baxter's lab laboratory would begin to react on the polygraph test. So this is, this is some real nice, hard evidence that shows us that, that our, our minds do really reach beyond just our brains or beyond what we see. And when we look at something like that, we see that it's non-local. It's not happening in the same local spot. It's not happening in the same space. It's non-spatial. It's non-causal. It's not because I did this to this saliva that it had that response. And it's participatory. And there we've just stepped into the quantum mechanical world. And some of these traits are also so, there are a lot of very big generalizations about the right brain and the left brain. And we do know that our right brain and left brain are working together all the time. Anything we do, if we walk down the hall and answer a question, everything we do really is both sides of our brains. But we also know that our right hemisphere of our brain is very different from our left hemisphere of our brain. It's sort of like how and they're separate. They're two separate halves. It's sort of like how our ears cannot see, nor can our eyes hear. And so when we are in that aspect of our mind, we really have a different abilities to perceive things. And so I'd like to go ahead and take us into another little exercise right now. And this one, I think I've gotten my notes a little mixed up here. Oh, before I do. A lot of times I'm asked, what is the right voice to listen to inside my head, right? We have lots of different voices inside of our head. We have our parents' voices. We have the voices of authorities. We have doubts. And I think that it's very simple if we just remember that the voice of our higher self is always neutral and compassionate. It doesn't really have anything ever to do with shame, blame, or guilt. It's always about love, respect, and allowance. And I think that the nicest way that we can say this really is that the sheep know the voice of the shepherd, right? It's caring for us. It's loving. And I had an experience where I was uh, in a bad car accident, and shortly before that had happened, the person who was tailgating me, I looked at them and I thought, what's with this person? And I heard a little voice that said, you could pull over and let this one pass. It's an option. It wasn't a demand. It wasn't a command. It was just a little option. It was some one of the things in that vast field of possibilities. 
And I didn't. I decided, oh, well, I'll just flip the rearview mirror up instead. And <laughs> so I didn't listen to it. And then I wound up in a big car crash with this person. And it was all, you know, worked itself out. Because I feel that spirit is constantly around us, helping us. In fact, scrambling against, with our free will choices to work out the scenario for our highest possible good all the time. And so I think that if we are listening from our heart space rather than our mind, we're usually into that right voice of whatever we want to have. And so now I'd love to go ahead and uh, just guide us into a little exercise that's uh, called, Do You Have a Message for Me? And this little exercise is one that I learned from my, one of my mentors, and uh, she was a, a person who brought messages from spirit. And so what I'd love for you all to do is, if you feel like it, go ahead and get comfortable and put your feet down on the ground again and close your eyes. And this is about receiving a, a message from a spirit guide. And so again, we're going to use our imagination. And a spirit guide can appear to us as a person or an animal or a, a ball of light. It doesn't really much matter. So just imagine yourself in a beautiful place can be some place where you that you're familiar with or some place that you've never been to before and let yourself be very comfortable there and now go ahead and invite a guide to appear to you and just use your imagination and trust yourself and greet your guide and ask them for their name And let yourself remember the name. And now ask this guide, do you have a message for me? And if you need to, ask for any clarity. And allow this time with your guide to begin to come to a close. And thank your guide. Know that you can always call upon them anytime. begin to return to your normal waking consciousness. Take a couple of relaxed and easy breaths. Stretch your body a little bit and open your eyes. And let yourself remember what you received. Maybe a key word or two of what that experience was like for you so that you can journal about it later. It's a nice thing for us to do. And this is just another way of asking within. I've had some wonderful spirit guides in my life. Probably the most useful and helpful was a horse fly. It came to me, her name was <laughs> And she taught me a lot about death and how to embrace death. And this was shortly before my horse died, because I had my horse for uh, 35 years. She lived a very long time, nearly twice the age of a normal horse. And um, I anticipated her passing, of course, as the years went on, and it made me very sad to think of it, to lose a dear family member like that. And so zzz, helped me to really understand and to let go. So sometimes our guides can be very, very, very helpful for us. And I always like to give a little homework assignment whenever I teach as well. And so I'd like to give this to you as a homework assignment. And this is an exercise called Just Being Me. And this is a very simple little exercise. And so just make a mental note about this so that you can do this later on your own time. So think about when you were six years old and your mother and father were there. Hopefully you had a nice mother and father who took good care of you. 
And if not, doesn't matter. You had your spirit guides and helpers around you to take care of you and help you as well. So just think about who you were when you were six. And for the homework assignment, what I'd like for you to do is to take about 10 minutes, first of all, just as your normal self at your current age, and think about a problem that you have in your life, something that you'd really like an answer to. And go ahead and write it down. And write down all the subtle nuances associated with that problem. Write down everything that you'd really like to know about it. Take the time to just really ferret it all out. And then put that piece of paper in your pocket. Fold it up and put it in your pocket. And then go out into nature somewhere. And just be me. And forget about the problem. You've already got it in your pocket. All the details are there. You don't have to think about it. And you know, so you might touch the ground. You might taste the dirt. You might look at a butterfly or a bug. You might dangle your feet in the water and twiggle your toes. And just be me for about 20 minutes. And then go back inside, get out your piece of paper, and give yourself 30 seconds to write the answer down. Quick, right? That's all you need. Two or three words, and it'll come to you. That's a wonderful way to get guidance within. And this is what our psychic ability is all about. It's about being interconnected to the whole and receiving guidance for how we can serve. When we are doing this, we are serving the highest good. And of course, I always think that our psychic ability, I'd like to give you a little bit of, of details on, on how I feel that we can really develop it. So the way that I like to look at this is I look at um, the model of a house. Okay, so on the basic floor is self-love. This is loving ourselves as we would love the divine, as a part of the divine, as a part of all of creation. We can uh, allow ourselves to love ourselves. And then on top of that solid basis of self-love comes the four cornerstones of meditation, right? We all know how meditation helps us to clear our minds and how to and bring peace to our bodies and to still that mind chatter. And prayer. Prayer is the way, and it can be non-denominational if you don't feel an affiliation to any religion. We can just proclaim to the universe whatever or ask or give gratitude. So prayer is the second cornerstone. And then as well, dream interpretation. When we work with our dreams, our dreams are wonderful images and messages that are coming from not only our higher self, but also our subconscious mind, our bodies, what's going on with our bodies and what's going on with our lives on a deeper level. And when we work with our dreams in the morning and we see our dream images, that's engaging our clairvoyant function. That's using our vision center. And we also are using some of those right brain or quantum attributes when we're working with our dreams as well, because we're using, and of course our left brain too, we're teasing out the details of the dreams, we're remembering, we're working with it, and then we get that flash of insight. Ah, oh, I know what this is about. And so practicing that is a great thing for us to practice. And then the fourth cornerstone, which is often uh, not even acknowledged and underappreciated, is our sanctuary. A place where we can be alone, where we can be with our thoughts, where we can allow ourselves to think. And so I'd like to give you one more little exercise right now, if you would. And just go ahead and close your eyes for just a moment. And think about a sanctuary that you had as a child because sanctuary is a natural part of being human. And so think about a place that you had when you were a little person where you could go and be alone. And just acknowledge it. And now think about a place that you had when you were a teenager. And just acknowledge that. And now think of where your sanctuary may be that you have now. Where you go to give yourself time to be by yourself. And then go ahead and allow yourself to come back to your normal waking consciousness and open your eyes. And stretch your bodies a little bit. That's nice. <laughs> Our sanctuaries are beautiful places for us to be. When I was a child, I had a, some bushes at the neighbor's house that I could go and scoot under, and they were right along the sidewalk. And I could lay there on the dirt on my back and look up through the leaves at the sky. 
and people could come by on the sidewalk, even people with dogs, and nobody knew I was there. It was a wonderful thing to have. Children often have little hidey holes that they can go to. So it's a nice thing for us to acknowledge our sanctuaries. And with that, those four cornerstones on the base of self-love, that's dream, interpretation, meditation, prayer, and sanctuary, we have our boundaries, which are our walls, right? Our good boundaries. I learned a saying years ago from my friend and mentor and teacher, Jana Massey, which was, only that which is mine to do. No more, no less. That's a wonderful saying, isn't it? It's a good boundary. So often, especially as women, we are acculturated and taught that we need to always say yes to everything. Oh, sure, yes, I'll do that. Oh, what do you need, you know? And sometimes we need to say, no, that's not mine to do. So that's a nice saying, only that which is mine to do, no more, no less. And when we have our boundaries in place, our walls of our house, then the heart of the home begins to beat. And I consider the heart the great triple blessing, and that is the, our spirituality, our psychic ability, and our purpose, our true purpose in life. So when we have those conditions happening where we are loving ourselves enough to give ourselves time to work through our spiritual practices, then our, 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 we blossom, we grow, we bloom. And I feel that those three are intrinsically interconnected, that our spirituality, our psychic ability, and our purpose, if we have one of them going, the other two come along magically, right? So if we are really studying our spirituality and really working with that, we get flashes of insight. We find ourselves in our purpose. Or if we have a strong calling to our purpose, like let's say we're an artist, again, we'll have flashes of insight. We'll know what we want to paint. And we'll have uh, the image center will produce that image before us of what we're going to do. And so these three are the, uh, are the beating heart of the home. And with that, we wind up with the roof, which is our transcendence, which is our change in consciousness, which is what we're here to do. And as we each change our consciousness one by one, the consciousness of the whole changes. So that's my little way of looking at our, um, our psychic ability and our way of growth here. And now, in closing, I'd just like to guide you all into a beautiful little exercise that was a gift from my mentor and teacher, Jana Massey. And uh, if you'll all just take a moment and close your eyes and get comfortable. And then go ahead and breathe to your heart, to your heart center. Take a nice, relaxed, and easy breath. And then place the palms of your hands together and breathe to your heart again. And now relax your arms. And imagine a fountain. And let the color of the water change to pink. And then stand in the water let it flow over you and affirm from your divinity whatever healing needs take place I now allow and step out of the fountain allow the fountain to dissolve and the exercise is complete and thank you all so very much for joining me today. It's really been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you.